Now, in this section of Scripture, I want you to understand seven times, seven times James shares with us prayer and the value of prayer, what it means to be prayerful people. And we're going to look at this and unfold this in in three areas that we're going to look at, the centrality of prayer in three areas. And we're going to look at what James has to offer us here today. And hopefully from this, our prayer lives will be challenged that will deepen our walk in the area of prayer. And I get it, we're not perfect. We falter and we fail in this area so many times of the disciplines of the Christian life more than others. But hopefully we'll be challenged to pick it up a notch um, in the area of prayer. Now, I mentioned that James talks about this area of prayer seven different times here in this passage, and I want to share with you an illustration of prayer and how God holds us in tragedy in a moment of, of almost just overwhelming grief in our life. God is there, and And Diane Comp, who wrote a book called Window to Heaven, and the subtitle of the book is When Children See Life in Death. And in this book, one of the illustrations that she uses here is when she writes about a a woman by the name of Anne and her youngest son named TJ. And as any mother is, she loves her children and cares deeply for her children. And when she and her husband were married, she was kind of a nominal Christian, really wasn't walking with the Lord in a, in a deep and powerful way. But when she uh, married, that kind of became irrelevant to her. Even, even in her nominal Christian faith, it just kind of was put to the side. They were a wealthy family, her and her husband uh, being wealthy. They just kind of got into the wealth and their romance faded and so much so that the marriage she would consider to be an absolute and utter disaster. But the lifestyle had its reward, so she kept grinding it out because she loved the wealth. And she adored her youngest son, TJ. She told a friend that once, if anything ever happened to this marvelous five-year-old son of mine, they would have to lock her up. Anne had never sent her children to Sunday school. Never was the name of God ever mentioned in their family. But one day, TJ said to his mom, Mama, I love you more than anything in the world except God. And I love him a little bit more. She was taken aback and told him that was okay as long as it was God that he loved more than her. But why would he speak of God? Because she wondered, even more mysterious, is where is he hearing about God himself and God's love? And Because she never uttered the name of God, and nor was there any name mentioned in their household. Two days later was one of the coldest of a bitterly cold winter. And while his sister, TJ's sister, was on horseback out riding, TJ crossed a creek that was covered with snow, and he broke through the ice. He probably died immediately, but it took an hour and a half to find his body under the ice. The first words out of Anne's mouth when she heard the news was, I hate you, God. But even as she spit out these words, she felt herself being held in loving arms. As her world shattered around her, she remembered another mysterious thing. TJ had done that week. He had bought a Christmas gift for her at the secret Santa shop at school, and he kept trying to give it to her before Christmas. And she laughed and told him to put it away until Christmas time, and he was persistent, but she continued to prevail, and he put it away. When she got home, from the stables, she ran upstairs to the place where he kept that gift, and, he, and she opened it to find a beautiful necklace of a cross. Prior to the accident, 
Her husband had no religious belief, but he cried out to God for help and sensed an immediate response to his prayer. Slowly, their old materialistic lives melted away. Their marriage was healed, and they became new creatures in Christ. God takes circumstances, even as tragic as it is of the death of a five-year-old, to draw people to himself. T.J. loved God. He wanted his parents to know, especially his mama, to know that he was loved by God and she could be loved by him too. And from that tragedy comes forth the beauty of new creation, that God uses things like this to envelop us and hold us. And our situation may not be as tragic as Anne and TJ's and and all of their circumstances, but I want to tell you this, folks. You have either gone through something or you're about to go through something or you will go through something in the future where you will need to know the loving hand of God in your circumstances. You will need to know the touch of God. And I believe as we look at this scripture reference this morning in James, that James is trying to help the churches that he's writing to understand the suffering, the sickness, and all that they're going through is that God is in their very midst. And they just need to allow him to hold on to them in the moment. And he prescribes for them the way in which God will do so. And he's going to do it through their own prayers. He's going to do it through the community. And he's going to do it through his own presence. And as we look at this verse, I want us to understand here that this isn't, this isn't a very easy section of Scripture to interpret. Because depending on where we come from and our de- denominational bent and our, and our exposure to, the, to the, the, uh, the things that churches do, it raises various ways of looking at this scripture reference. And hopefully from keeping it in its ancient context and then how we might take it from its ancient context and apply it to our world today, we might find a way to be able to walk this out in our own contemporary time. But remember, context is king, and it must remain in its context. So let's not spin out of control here in James chapter 5, verses 13 to 18, and read into the text that's something that it's really not there. But as we look at this, several difficult questions come to mind here. And here are some of those questions that we need to kind of kick around and ask ourselves. What kind of suffering is James talking about in verse 13? What's suffering? I mean, some of us would say, well, I got a bunion on my toe and I'm suffering. Or as other people under financial and mental stress and I'm suffering there, what kind of suffering are we talking about here? What kind did he have in mind? Secondly, what type of sicknesses is James speaking of here? Is it the stomach flu? Is it mental depression? Is it, you know, stress? What is, what is he talking about here when he means sickness here? Why are prayers offered by the elders any different than any other believers in the body of Christ? Why does he emphasize that? What actually does anointing with oil mean and how is it practiced in the ancient culture and how is it practiced today? Does prayer for the sick 100% of the time restore people? Because I can remember reading in Scripture that Paul, although the Spirit worked through him to heal, he left a couple of his contemporaries sick while he was traveling. He didn't heal 100% of the time. How does sickness relate to sin? Does our sin cause our sickness? And vice versa. What kind of healing does verse 16 mean? Why does James insert rain in the passage that deals with healing And why in the world does Elijah have to do with this? What is that all about? Well, on and on and on it goes. You look at this scripture reference and you think, man, there's a lot that we have to unpack here. 
And I'm going to give you some insight here. We are not going to answer all of these questions in today's message. Matter of fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave some of these hanging out there for tension and ask you, the contemporary reader and believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, to go find out some of the answers to these questions. You dig in and study and grow as you explore some of these things. And what does it mean for you to be answering these questions and then own your faith? Don't let somebody else answer it for you. Don't let some uh, way of doing something answer it for you. You dig, you grow, you understand, and then you come to the realization of what that means in our culture and in our time here and our practice. But as we approach this text, I want you to understand that as James shares with us seven times this idea of prayer, that he has in mind the centrality of prayer in several areas. And the first area that he has in terms of the centrality of prayer is in our physical needs. Every one of us have physical needs. You are a physical being. You are not a ghost. You're not of a whisper or a vapor. You have physical properties. You take up space in time. You cannot walk through walls, although some of us might think we can. We're not an avenger or have some superhuman powers. If that's the case, then stand over here and take a good long run and try to go right through that wall over there. And then we'll call the ambulance and have you picked up. And then we'll put you in a straitjacket for thinking you can go through the wall. We all have physical needs here. And James is addressing some physical needs in verse 13 when he brings to the forefront two, um, two subjects here. That is, suffering and sickness. And what I like in between here, these bookends between suffering and sickness, is this idea of praising. If someone is cheerful, let them praise the Lord. The word literally is the word solo, P-S-A-L-L-O, solo. It means to sing a psalm. You know, you hear those guys that, you know, you know guys and gals that are really happy, you know, and they're, you know, I think Disney has a whistle while we work kind of deal. I think it's the elves, not the elves, the dwarfs. Uh, they're all, uh, you know, whistling while they're working, doing like, they're cheerful. They love what they're doing. You know, you hear people like, oh, we're singing in the shower, you know, kind of thing, because they're happy, and, you know, whatever it is, like, you're just like, woo, I'm, I'm just doing what I'm doing, because I'm really cheerful. And that's great, because that's a good attitude booster, and it keeps you up on top of where you're at. But on either side of this idea of being cheerful and singing is the woeful and dreadful thing of suffering and being sick. And those two subjects... James addresses here, and I want you to understand the word suffering, as I have up there, is the word kakopotheo. And that first word, kako, if the S on the end of it, means evil. And so a person who is suffering has somehow come across something that has been or is evil that is affecting them in some way. And typically, it's probably, in the context that James is writing here, is probably the wealthy, non-believing landowners who are taking advantage of the Christians and producing evil in their life by not paying them, making them work long hours, beating them, all those kind of things. And James says, man, you are under duress. Hang in there. If you're suffering, what does he say? What's the... What's the um, the remedy to suffering here in the text. If anyone is suffering, question mark, then he, what? Must pray. Must pray. He must pray. So right out of the chute, right out of the gate, James dials us in. This is the solution. It's about prayer. That's why it's so central here. Because I'm enduring all of this evil, all these things coming against me, I must pray. Notice in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, Paul is writing about his imprisonment. And if anybody can 
put a plaque on the wall in terms of being mistreated in the Hall of Fame of being imprisoned, it would be Paul. And he says here in 2 Timothy 2.9, For which I suffer hardship, kakopotheo, meaning that evil is being done to him, even to the imprisonment as a criminal. They're treating me like I'm an evil person. And oh, by the way, they are bringing evil against me as well. But the word of God, he says, here's his hope, is not imprisoned. Just because they're doing this to me physically, God's word is going out and doing its thing. And then even in that same book, two chapters later, he addresses Timothy, his young pastoral protege, who is the teaching elder in his church, and he says this, but you, Timothy, you the pastor, you the teaching elder, you're the one who has planted this church, you grow it, here's what you are to do. Be sober, Timothy, in all things. Endure hardship. Kakopatheo, this is coming at you, Timothy. I know it's evil. I know you're experiencing this evil, but hang in there. Endure it. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. What he's saying here is push through that curtain, Timothy. Carry on. And James is writing his contemporary. They are suffering. Go back to James chapter 1. What does he say? When you experience various trials, my, my brethren, count it all what? Joy. Count it all joy. And then we look at that and go, no way am I going to do that. But there's a reason that we can be joyous in the midst of pressure and evil coming against us. Push through, push through, push through. This idea of the sickness here simply means that a person is weak and feeble and lacking strength. Whether it's the stomach flu has got you weak or because of the stress of the evil coming against us, the pressure, the financial, mental, whatever it is, the body has started to run down and become weak. We're feeble. Extreme stress due to this evil treatment has caused this condition. And I want you to notice what he says here. Is anyone among you sick? Question mark. What's the solution? Look at the text. Call the elders and have them pray. See, we become weak in pretty much life because we are weak people. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. We all are prone to this. We're all prone to this. Help the weak. Help those that are feeble and lacking in strength. And be patient with everyone. Be patient with everyone. So what is the solution here? Is this what we call an intervention? Not like a cult intervention where we've got to you know, unbrainwash somebody or something. Think of it as an if-then statement. If you're this, then do this. If you're suffering, you pray, you own it, you go before the Lord and pray. If you're ill and sick and feeble and feeling alone and just weak, then call for someone else to come alongside of you and prop you up and help you move down the trail of the journey of the Christian life. There must be an intervention. Notice here, verse 13, if you're suffering, You must pray. Notice that, must pray. Look at verse 14. Is anyone sick? They must call for the elders. This whole idea of calling and must and prayer is absolutely a command. We are commanded to do this. So when you're suffering, you pray. And do it continually. Knock on heaven's door continually. It is a command to call those with spiritual fortitude and strength to come alongside of you and to help you and not push them away and keep them at uh, arm's length. But it's to call alongside because that's what faith community does. 
See, it means to continually plead with God over and over and over again. Wear out the prayer rug. Wear out the door knocker to heaven. God wants you to do that. Jesus spoke in in Luke 18. He tells a story of a widow in a certain city, and there was a judge there. He was an unrighteous judge. He, He didn't respect God. He didn't fear God. He didn't respect anybody. He was just the judge. And the widow had a problem. She needed legal counsel. She had enemies, people that were trying to take advantage of. Now remember, a widow in the ancient culture is way down here on the societal uh, uh, rung. It's a patriarchal society. And if you're a widow and nobody's caring for you, you just kind of get tossed off to the side. And this happened to this woman. And Jesus tells the story that she kept coming to him and saying, Give me legal protection from my enemies in verse 3. And he kept putting her off, kept putting her off. Get away from me, woman. I don't need to hear you. Get away from me. And he kept just like a gnat around. He's like, get away. And finally, in verse 4, while he was unwilling, even though he said to himself, I do not fear God nor respect man, even though I, this widow, yet because of this, this widow bothers me. (laughs) Bothers me. I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, continually coming to me, she is going to wear me out. It's like, here she comes again. It's like, oh, can somebody run block for me? Get that woman out of here. That was, the, that was his mindset. It's like, nah, not again. Every day, every day, she was there. Judge, give me counsel. And finally, he relented and said, fine. And now Jesus takes that situation and he compares it to what God does for his believers. And notice what he says here. Verse 7, Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night and will he delay long over them? Question mark. Verse 8, I tell you that he will bring about justice to them quickly. He will bring it quickly. And then the the biggest question that just hangs out there in this little section is, will the Son of Man, when He comes, find faith? Are you enough of the mindset to have faith to go to God every day with this situation? Because God wants to know if this is important to you. So many times we come before the Lord and we just throw up a prayer flare. You know, go... And it goes up for a while. And then what happens to that flare eventually? It burns out. And it goes dark again. And we think that our prayer is like, you know, we just shoot up a prayer. It goes up there and just hangs there. And then it goes out and we think we've done enough. We need to constantly come to the Lord and keep knocking, and keep knocking, and keep knocking. Instead of shooting up a prayer flare, we need to put the bat signal up there and leave it on, and just leave it on until the Lord shows up. That's what we need. We need a contemporary bat signal, and rather than a bat, we need to put a cross up there and say, Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, come and help me. I need it, Lord. I need your help. You see, God wants to comfort. He wants to bring comfort to you. Look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction. If you're not afflicted, you might not be doing something right in your Christian walk. I'm not saying go out and find the most evil thing and wallow around in it and get afflicted that way. I'm just saying, are you an enemy toward the kingdom of darkness? Or are you just kind of skirting around trying to like, woo, I don't know where I'm at. God comforts those who are in affliction. And when we are comforted, we can turn and comfort other people as well. That's faith community. That's what we're supposed to do as the body of Christ is to comfort others. How do we do that? Man, when you're anxious, cast it on Him. 
because God cares for you. He cares for you, church. Every last one of you, God cares for you. Do you believe that? Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I better believe that. I want to believe that, that God cares for me. And when James addresses this idea of prayer being central to our physical needs, he says there are three actions that need to take place when suffering and sickness is going on. And the first one is this. There must be a calling a parakaleo, to call alongside. This word is also related to the word that is used for the Holy Spirit as the advocate or a counselor, the parakletos. It's to call alongside oneself to help walk in the journey. And when we're suffering, it says to call someone to help and pray. And here, the person who is suffering or sick and weak must call for the elders. Now comes the question, why is it so much that the elders and their prayer life is any better than anybody else out there? And I would say, they're not. But these people who have been set aside and anointed and put in leadership positions are one that know the word, they teach the word, they can come alongside somebody and be able to minister and muster all of that faith, all of that knowledge, all of that that spiritual uh, adept and all that to the situation and encourage that person to move forward in their journey. It isn't that the elders are anything more special than anybody else. It's simply that God has placed them there to be shepherds, to walk with people, and it's a place for us to call out to so that they can come alongside. You see, when we're in an emergency crisis situation, we want to know who the leader in the room is. We want to know who's leading this crisis. That's what leadership is. And so when it all goes down, we need to know who's going to stand up and be the leader. And it's the same thing here. When I'm suffering, when I am sick, when I am weak, all I care about is knowing who's the one that's leading and is going to come alongside of me and prop me up. And in this text, it's the elders. See, the calling must be done by the person who is ill. You've got to own this. If you're struggling, then call. The second thing that needs to take place is absolutely praying. Don't just say, oh, I'll pray about it. You know, when some people come up to say, hey, would you please be in prayer with me about this? And then they explain what it is, and you say, I'll be in prayer, and then you go off the other way. Are you really going to pray about that? Did you write it down? Oh, my prayer journal's down there. Inside your prayer journal, there's like uh, spots where you can write stuff down, notes. Did you write that down so you could pray for it later? Pray for it then and pray for it later. Don't let the opportunity of prayer go by you. So when somebody says, would you be praying for me about this? You stop right there, block everything else and said, let's get on our knees right here and pray about it. And ask God's favor for it. Paul writes in Ephesians 6, 18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on alert for all perseverance and petition for all the saints. The people you know who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, pray for them. Pray for them. That's what our our prayer journal helps us to focus our prayer on a daily basis to pray for missionaries and leadership and government and military families and all that. Just pray for each other. That's what that prayer journal does. And there's Looks like there's two more right over there. Need to be claimed. Has a, needs to have a prayer journal home right over there. Poor things. <laughs> no, I'm as mistaken. There's only one. He's over here lonely. Look at that. 
poor thing. Hey, there we go. Now it's a Combs. Pray, pray, pray. That's what we're called to do is pray. Then the third thing that he, action he wants us to do is this idea of anointing. Now, let me talk about this anointing because I don't think you think what this really means in the ancient culture. Because a lot of times in our contemporary culture, what we do is somebody calls and says, hey, would you anoint me with oil and pray over me? And so what we do is we get out our little vial of oil, we put a little on our tip of our finger, and we rub it on their forehead, and then we pray over them. And, and that's fine. If that's the contemporary practice in our context, that's great. But don't think that that is what was going on in the ancient culture, because let me unpack this for you and explain what was going on when we talk about anointing. And I want to take a moment and set this context for you so you have it in your mind what goes on when somebody is anointed with oil. This word anointing, alepho, which means to besmear, rub, or cover over with oil. Literally, cover over with oil. It isn't just taking your finger and putting a little cross on somebody's forehead or something like that. I mean, this is like, when you call for the anointing, you better be ready to have a change of clothes with you because that's what's coming. Okay, pins oil. Oh, let's just rub, okay? That's what it's me. Rub, besmear, and cover over. Now, why is it this way? Why does it literally mean that? Well, here's the thing. In the ancient culture, medical practice hadn't really kind of, wasn't real advanced. So when a person who has had evil treatment against them, beatings and lashes, wounds and trials, and their body is marked up because they're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, those wounds need to be tended to. They need to be bandaged. And when they are scabbed over and it's itching and it's, and it's just horrendous and sometimes you've had that scab just tore off and it's just like, ah! When you rub oil on a scab, it softens that and you can bandage it up. That's what we're talking about here. Because in the ancient culture, folks, if you don't believe it or not, these people were mistreated bar none. Look what they did to Jesus. Laid open him, his skin, his back, flailed it, cat of nine tails, just ripping his skin all over the place. Christians were undergoing that as well. And so this was a way for the ancient church to not only have spiritual leaders come along, but also medicinal leaders to come along and minister both spiritually and and physically to those that were under extreme duress. Look what Isaiah writes in Isaiah chapter 1. It kind of sets the context. 700 years before Jesus comes along, God is really kind of laying this against Israel. He says, where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head of the sick, the whole heart is faint, the sole of the foot even to the head. There's nothing sound in it, only bruises, welts, raw wounds. And notice here what isn't being done. Not pressed out, not the wounds massaged so that the swelling goes down, not bandaged, nor what? Anointed with oil. Tend to the wounds is what Isaiah is saying here. In Mark chapter 16, verse 1, the Sabbath was over. Mary Magdalene and the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might come and alepho, anoint, rub, besmear, pour oil all over the body because of their love for Christ. They wanted to tend to his wounds. Because remember, the speed at which the body was taken down off the cross, packed with spices and wrapped up real quick and put into the tomb... All about a very uh, respectful way was done very hastily because the sundown was coming and Sabbath was about to begin. 
And both Marys thought that that proper caring for the body had not been done. So they wanted to anoint the wounds with oil. John eleven two. 2. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment. That is, Alepho the Lord with this ointment, wiped her feet with her, with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now think about this for a minute. You sit here in your contemporary time with closed toe shoes, except if you're a woman or wearing flip-flops today. Sometimes we wear sandals and our toes are open and whatnot. But think about it back in the day. Dirt, donkey do, stones, rocks, wood, you stub your toe on something. I mean, your feet are just horrendous. Not something really nice to look at. And Mary comes along. You ever had a foot massage? Anybody? Come on, you can admit to it. Yeah, I have one. Yeah, cool. Man, you talk about tired feet. It's like, oh my goodness, that feels so good. Especially when they get a nut and they're just inside your foot. Just really getting after it. Man, it feels so good on the feet. And it's like, man, that's relief. What do you think Mary's doing here? Jesus has walked miles and miles and miles. And as a way of respect and showing her honor to him and humility before him, she cracks open this ointment, lays it all over his feet, and then just in this most beautiful act of submission, she gets down near his feet with her hair and just begins to massage his feet. Ministering to him. Mark 6, 13, they were casting out many demons. His disciples were doing this, and they were anointing with oil many sick people, those that were weak and struggling in their physicality and whatever ailments. They were taking oil and rubbing their bodies with that to refresh them. And it says that through the Spirit they were healing these people. So when we read this scripture reference here in its context, I want you to continue to remember in the ancient culture to anoint someone with oil wasn't simply to have a little vial of oil and put it on their forehead and pray for them. It was actually tending to the wounds physically of those that were struggling. Which here kind of lends itself, well, what about the ladies who were struggling with wounds that were mistreated and all of that? That's why we had deaconesses in the ancient culture and why we have deaconesses today. So that when those intimate times like this were there, the ladies could minister to the ladies and the men to the men. So it didn't get awkward. God takes care of His church through healing grace and through a powerful move of His Spirit. And then I want you to understand in the context of this centrality of prayer, James turns our attention to spiritual needs. Notice what he says here, verse 16. Therefore, because God, in the anointing, in the prayer, the one that has sin, it will be forgiven them and they will be raised up or restored, sozo, the restore. He says, therefore, because of all that, in verse 16, confess your sins to one another. Notice here, this is a practical step, is a community step. Not that one would get up in front of the whole entire congregation and air their dirty laundry. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about here is when there is a need for confession, that we do it outwardly to one another. Not some booth over here with a pastor or a priest in it, we confess there. What I'm talking about is intimate community in our small groups and one-on-one, and those that you have, have harmed in some way, go and confess your sin to them in some way. You see, whenever we drag things out into the sunlight, it sanitizes it. You see, mold, mildew, and all that wants to grow in the dark where it's dank and stanky and just like over there, just gnarly. We need to drag all that out into the sunlight and let it just sanitize it. And the same thing with sin. Sin desires to remain hidden and private. 
Satan would rather operate in the dark and in the shadows and in secret, whereas God desires all of this to be exposed and dealt with forthrightly. Now is the moment. And you guys who have been walking with us through our Genesis series, you know what I'm talking about here. Because in our Genesis series, there was what we would call our Genesis confrontation. Adam and Eve had sinned in Genesis chapter 3. They hear God coming and walking in the garden, and what do they do? They jump into the bushes and hide themselves. And God comes walking along and asks the first question, Where are you? God knew where they were at. He knew where they were at. He just wanted them to come out of the darkness and their hiding and deal with their sin. Then he confronts them. He confronts Adam and he confronts Eve. And Adam throws them both under the bus and he turns to Eve and says, she says this about the snake and being beguiled and tempted. And he says, what have you done? What have you done? Then he confronts Abel, I mean Cain, whose first murder he grabs a rock and he cracks his brother over the noggin pot and kills him and buries him. And his blood's crying out from the ground and he, God comes up to Cain and says, where is Abel, your brother? Does he not know where Abel's at? He knows he's in that hole over there dead. But he wants to confront Cain to own up to his sin. And then he asks him that question that he asked Eve, what have you done? And ever since then, God keeps asking the question, Christian, what have you done? What have you done? God desires that sin be dragged, screaming and kicking out into the light and dealt with. That's what God wants. So this morning, think through your life about areas of sin that we are holding on to, harboring and keeping secret and in the dark. And then the second thing that we need to make sure that we're doing is we're praying for one another. Pray for one another. Here again, we see this is a community faith journey here. Each one is to come together and pray for each other. It's significant that our prayer journals have note areas in it to pray. Write down the things there in our prayer journals. Your personal prayer life should be a life of interceding for other people. Take their concerns and pray for them. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. That word devote there means to remain steadfastly. It's like when you have a dog, you know, one of those uh, kind of juvenile dogs that like to play with that rope toy and you... They grab onto it, and you grab the other end, and they're not going to let go. And you're just like, yeah, yeah, and you're like, yeah, 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 you, you know, and they're, they're dragging it around and all that. That's, that's how we need to just latch on to prayer and hold on to it and just shake it until that other person lets go. Hold on to that. That's what God wants us to do in our devotion for prayer. And you know how we do this? We do it in community, and the way we do it is through this. Get into one of the growth groups that we have. Get into a growth group. They're so important to a faith community. That's why we have encounter, encourage, and engage. That middle word there, encourage, is where our growth groups come from. Encourage one another in those growth groups. And the other statement I have at the bottom is, if you don't have a time slot that fits yours, then start one. If you don't feel like you want to be the one that leads one, then host one and have another teacher come into your home. But the last one we can all do is attend one. Find one and attend one. I cannot emphasize this enough. And matter of fact, I would love to see tons and tons of people in weekly growth groups throughout the week and throughout the year. I would love for us to set a goal for us to have five new growth groups starting in the fall. And maybe you need to begin praying about this. Maybe you're the one that's going to lead one. 
You're going to break off of whatever group you're in, start one and grow and split the cell and watch this thing grow. And it's incredible when the Holy Spirit grabs onto this and moves through it. The body's ministered to. Get involved in our G groups. Man, it's so important. It's so, so important. And if you need help in this, let me know. Pastor Matt and I would love to be able to hook you up and get you going uh, in these areas of our growth groups. And the final area of prayer is that the centrality of prayer comes in this illustrious, uh, illustrative purpose of looking at Elijah's life. Elijah was just simply a man just like us. Why did James throw this in here? He wants you to know and understand that Elijah was just simply a man just like you. He was human. He was prone to hunger. He was prone to depression. And he was prone to fear. And the last time I checked, all three of those are what we do. We're fearful, we get hungry, and we get depressed. And Elijah experienced all of that. But yet, you know what? He prayed. He was a righteous man, and he prayed. God declared him righteous, and things got done in the kingdom. You pray, Christian. You be like Elijah and pray. Be like him. And that's where you come in as a believer. You hold that same power as prayer. That doesn't matter. I don't care. Put your, put your picture in that, that uh, little square there somewhere. That's you. We're all common before God. But God has chosen to declare us righteous in Christ. Take that, run with it, exercise it, and pray. Faith coupled with prayer and standing on the foundation of righteousness can accomplish much. But you've got to have faith. You've got to have faith. So let me give you some application points here. I'm going to ask you some questions, and hopefully you'll meditate upon them and work with it this week as you go throughout uh, this week, ready yourself for next time. Number one is this. What physical need do you have that needs prayer right now? And at the end of our time here, if you need us to pray down here with you, I would love to. I'd love to have the elders come down here and pray for you. Come on down. We'd love to pray for you here. What physical need do you have? Secondly, what spiritual need do you have that you're struggling with? Maybe God's calling you to something new. Maybe He's calling you to start a growth group and you just need some encouragement. You need kind of a spiritual, like... <laughs> Come on up, and I'll help you do that. Thirdly, what issue in your life needs to be surrendered to God? And then the question is, why aren't you in a growth group? Whatever question, how you answer that, too busy, not, not the right time, there's no time during the week, whatever it is, well, then... Lead one, host one, attend one. I don't care. But why don't we have more people in the body, in these growth groups? Because there's where real spiritual growth is going to explode and expand exponentially. Get into a growth group. And then the, the drum that I continually just bang and bang and bang is engage your oikos this week. Get involved in their lives. Help them to know that your faith is real and it's a journey that you're on that can make a difference in their life. You remember little TJ from our earlier illustration? His mama was his oikos. And he kept continually telling her about God. Where he heard about it, she doesn't know. But I know one thing, TJ knew him and continued to share with his mama that was his oikos. His oikos got reached. His mom and dad came to faith in Christ. Go reach your way costs.